Okay, so now we get to our second reading. And for the second reading, there are actually two options on Easter Sunday morning, which the priest is allowed to choose. You're, going to choose, you're one of two possible options. And um, I'm more interested in one than the other, but we'll talk about both of them. So the first one comes from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Brothers and sisters, if then you are raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ your life appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. Okay, really great. So here's here's the principle. The idea is that Jesus comes and he tells us about a new kingdom, this this kingdom of God that is that is coming, that has already arri- arrived, and and ultimately is the kingdom that will last into eternity. And where is this kingdom? Well, it is it is it is above because the heavens are considered above, right? So it's it's not and it's not so much that it is like you know up in the sky somewhere, but when Jesus ascends into heaven, where does he go? He goes upward. So what Paul is getting at is okay, if you were raised with Christ, Christ who died, and then he rose from the dead, if you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Well, how do we know that Christ is seated at the right hand of God? Again, because of the ascension. So Paul is writing not, not before the ascension. He's actually writing after the ascension because he doesn't have his conversion even until after the day of Pentecost, like pretty pretty far after the day of Pentecost. So he, he's, he's writing with this understanding of like Jesus has ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. And so Paul is saying like, let your mind follow him. Uh, the, the apostles in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascends into heaven, their eyes follow Jesus and they kind of get stuck looking upward. And these two angelic creatures again come and they say, why are you looking upward? Like Jesus has ascended into heaven. But, but so it's not so much like our eyes got to be upward, but it's that our mind has to be upward. It's our mind has to be in the kingdom of heaven where Jesus is the rightful king. So think of what is above, not of what is on earth. Sometimes we can get caught up in, in earthly things, in earthly pleasures and in, in, in earthly goods, as good as they might be. If, if they take our mind off of things of what is above, then we're actually, we're missing out on everything that God wants. And sometimes these earthly distractions, as again, as good as they might be, sometimes they might consume us in such a way that we actually stray from the way of heaven. So Paul says this, think of what is on, what is above, not of what is, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When, when do you die? Well, in baptism, actually. Paul writes this to the Romans in chapter 6. Do you not know that when you were baptized, you were baptized into the death of Christ? So you've died to this earth. And and maybe maybe we still get to enjoy things of this earth, but the, the point is that like this isn't our home any longer. We've, we've died to this earth. And so to not let yourself get so caught up with earthly things, but instead to let yourself be caught up with heavenly things. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Like that, That's the idea anyway. Is that uh, Paul says to the Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. And this is what our life is meant to be. When Christ your life appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. Jesus is going to come and come back again. And he is our life. He's the one who lives within us. And we're going to see him. The, like in, in our first reading, Peter talked about how, how Jesus, he rose, but he didn't appear to everybody. In the end, he will appear to everybody. And when Christ your life appears, you too will appear with him in glory. You're going to share that glory that is to come. If, if what? You were raised with Christ. So that's that's the, the first option for the second reading. The second option for the second reading comes from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 6b through 8. Brothers and sisters, do you not know that a little yeast leavens all the dough? Clear out the old yeast so that you may become a fresh batch of dough, inasmuch as you are unleavened. For our paschal lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, this one, this one is, is the one that I'm, I'm more interested in because I think it's just really cool. So what happens on, on Holy Thursday is Jesus celebrates the Last Supper, which is a Passover meal. So there's this context of, of the entire triduum including the the meal, including the crucifixion, including the resurrection, the entire triduum is focused on uh, or or maybe centered around the Passover. 
So the Passover meal, I've, t- I've spoken about this before, the Passover meal begins in Exodus chapter 12, where God sets the people free from, from uh, or by way of Moses, sets them free from the Egyptians because they take the Passover lamb, a male lamb without blemish, a year old, they sacrifice it, they put the blood on the doorpost, and they eat the flesh of the lamb that night. And the Lord passes over their houses and preserves them from the death, from experiencing the death of their firstborns, of man and beast alike. From there, the people are set free. They, they cross through the Red Sea on dry land. They're in the desert. They continue to celebrate the Passover as a memorial ritual as the Lord commands back in Exodus chapter 12. So that every year they celebrate the Passover. And, and when they celebrate it, it's it's that they're, 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 they're not remembering what took place back then, but that by God's divine grace, by his by some mystery of his grace, the past becomes present. It's a memorial ritual thing that, that they, they enter into the story as though for the first time, as though they themselves have been set free from Egypt. And this took place all the way up into, uh, to and through the time of Jesus. So Paul is, is talking about this, like our Paschal sacrifice has been, uh, our Paschal lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Well, so the Passover lamb, which is who Jesus is, he's the lamb of God, John the Baptist calls him. Uh, he's been sacrificed. So so what? Well, part of the sacrifice was in, was eating unleavened bread. And so there's this distinction between the Jews and, excuse me, but, but between leavened and unleavened bread among the Jewish people. The unleavened bread was the bread that was fit for the, the ritual Passover because it hadn't been tainted by the yeast. Whereas leavened bread was tainted by the yeast. And so what is Paul saying? He says, do you not know that a little yeast leavens all the dough? So clear out the old yeast. At the time of Passover every year and and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the people had to get rid of all of their yeast so that they could eat only unleavened bread. So Paul is is sort of playing on this. He's like, clear out the old yeast, get rid of it. Because now it's it's, like we're living in the time of the unleavened bread. And he's not speaking like in a literal way, like we can't eat loaves of bread. But but he's, he's playing on what is taking place here. So that you may become a fresh batch of dough in as much as you are unleavened. As you see, because because of what God has done in the person of Jesus, in in dying for us, rising from the dead, setting us free, and giving us this new unleavened bread that leads to life, in, in giving this to us, it's meant to change our lives, which is meant to what? To uproot the corruption that is within us. And this happens, of course, it begins to happen with us when we're baptized, when we die with Christ so that we may rise with him. But then every time we encounter Jesus in a real way, it is meant to root out the corruption that is within us. And so we are meant to be like unleavened bread. For Christ, our Paschal Lamb, excuse me, our, our Paschal Lamb Christ has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. What is the feast? Well, the feast is what Jesus gives us when he says, do this in memory of me. What, what is the feast? The feast is the mass. So let us, let us celebrate the feast where we feast on what? We feast on nothing less than the body and blood of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead in the form of unleavened bread. So let us celebrate the feast, not with the old yeast, the, least, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let your life be changed and transformed by, by the Lord Jesus, by the gifts that he gives to you. When you celebrate the Passover meal, as he commands us to celebrate, let it be in sincerity and in truth. Let, let there be no duplicity within you, but instead let your life be one that is truly revealed to be transformed. A life that truly reveals that Jesus lives within you. Beautiful, powerful. Okay, I pray and, and hope that, that you have a deep encounter with the Lord, especially especially on Easter. And I just really encourage you to pray for those who will be attending Easter Mass, who maybe don't normally attend Mass. Who have, who have fallen away or who become uh, lax in the, the practice of their Catholic Christian faith, pray for them that perhaps by a miracle of God's grace, they can encounter Jesus in a new way, crucified and risen from the dead, that they might have a conversion actually and, and return to the Lord, return to the church that he established. Okay, I'll look forward to sharing next week with you. God bless you. Peace.